In the name of justice and freedom I fight. And though the road may be long, I find comfort in knowing that I am not alone. Join me in the Assassin's Den. Hello, everybody. Welcome to another episode of The Assassin's Den. I'm Loomer, your host as always, along with Esco Blades. Hello, Esco. Hi, how you doing? Good, good. Um, and joining us today, we have Gio, who helps run the Everything Assassin's Creed Tumblr. So, hey, Gio. Hello. <laughs> hey. Uh, we also have Endy, who is an artist in the community who did uh, an amazing piece of art of Connor called Stars and Stripes for Ubisoft's recent Art of the Assassin traveling art exhibit. So, hey, Endy. Hey. <laughs> Okay, and finally, for our first post-launch podcast, we're very fortunate and honored to be joined by Noah Watts, who provides the voice of Radon Hagedon, also known as Connor. So, Noah, thank you so much for joining us today. My pleasure. Good to be here. Awesome. Yeah, so, um, as always, we've collected v questions from various parts of the Assassin's Creed community, and we'll be asking Noah these throughout the podcast. Um, as a note, we'll also be discussing spoilers for AC3, so be careful if you haven't finished the main campaign yet. Um, so Noah, to, to start off, I thought we could briefly talk about your background in acting and kind of how it led to you uh, being involved in Assassin's Creed 3. Um, our highest voted community question is actually from Kelsey Johnson, aka Joke, who asks, um, what brought you into the Assassin's Creed franchise? Were you scouted or did you seek out this role yourself? So maybe if you could briefly talk about your acting history and then how it led into that. Okay. Um, when I was, uh, I think I started doing uh, theater and plays around fifth grade, I started in, in the... In the, you know middle school doing that I did Oz and uh, Scarecrow and uh, I think Bill Sykes and uh, Oliver Twist and um, around age 16 I got involved in uh, speech and debate in high school and that was the speech side was basically com competitive acting you would memorize 10 minute monologues and compete all over the state and so I started doing that and then uh, I had a bunch of you know plays in high school that I was also a part of. And then uh, around, uh, I think it was my senior year, uh, I was a, it was the fall of my senior year, I got a role in a movie called The Slaughter Rule with uh, Ryan Gosling and David Morse. And it was the first thing I'd ever done. It was a t tel uh, you know independent film that uh, was, was done in Montana. And it, you know, I, I tried out and I got it. And I, did, I think I did three days or three or four days on that and uh, had some scenes with Ryan and, and uh, David. And uh, it kind of just sparked my interest because I got paid, you know, and it was I was treated very well. And then following uh, spring of my high school senior year, I got a role in a movie called Skins, which was a Native movie directed by Native, written by Natives, uh, starring Natives. Um, the producer was a man named John Killick, who has done a lot of Spike Lee movies. So I had a I had a bigger role in that. It was I think the third principal role, and um, I played the son of the main of the main character. Graham Greene is the actor who played my father. And uh, after that, I I mean I, I I went I went to nationals for speech. I had I got fourth in the nation for dramatic interpretation, which was like a ten minute drama monologue. And I performed in front of I don't know 1,500 people, and it really I mean it really just uh, lit the flame. And I got a scholarship after that to go to the American Academy of Dramatic Arts in Los Angeles. So I just kind of, after my senior year, I just kind of waited and till the summer was over. And then I went to school at the American Academy. And then uh, I got, a, I started getting more film auditions and film roles. And I just, um, I wasn't allowed to work at the same time as being in the American Academy. So I had to drop out of school in order to, to work uh, professionally. And uh, I think, I mean, it was a good choice because I, I, got, I got paid and I also got first-hand experience on set working with uh, professional actors and, uh, you know, real crew. And so that's basically where it started and, and I kind of, you know, went from role to role after that, you know, and just been doing it ever since. Awesome. C3, um, they uh, auditioned me like I was auditioning for a film. I I got a casting call from my manager from from a casting agent or a director in uh, Culver City or somewhere down here in L.A. And I went into the office and it, it was presented to me like it was a film, and it looked to me like 
was a film. It was a period piece. And I just went in and I read it, you know, like I would audition for a movie. And uh, I got called back. <laughs> and I still didn't know that it was AC. And then, you know, and I did read it again. And then Matt uh, Turner, the one of the writers, came down to L.A. And then he was in the room. I didn't know who he was. And that's when they told me it was AC. And I was pretty excited, but I didn't really want to show him because, you know. <laughs> and there, well, you know, so I don't want to show my car. But uh, I did another audition. And he didn't look at me the entire audition like he was writing notes the whole time. So in my head, I was like, well, this is over. I don't have this at all. Uh, he's not even looking at me. I mean, I'm doing the lines, but I can see him just, like, writing stuff down. And then it was you know, it was done and I walked out and I kind of forgot about it. And then a couple of weeks later, they said they wanted to, uh, they wanted to hire me for the role. And I was just ecstatic. It was great. Yeah. So, um, actually you, you, you kind of touched upon being excited, you know, during the audition process. I wanted to ask about your prior knowledge of the AC franchise. And actually one of the community questions, uh, comes from Pietro X and he asked sort of the same thing, which is, uh, had you played any of the previous games in the series? And if so, which one was your favorite one? So maybe you could just touch on that for us. Yeah, um, I've played all of them. I've done AC through Revelations, and uh, my favorite character is Altair. Uh, I think his... I like his um, delivery. I like, I like the time period a lot, and I think he was kind of... To me, he was very stone cold kind of guy, and that that really re what reminded me of what uh, you know a, a killer assassin would be, mm. kind of just no nonsense. This is what I have to do, and this is my this is what I do. I like Assassin's Creed Two a lot, though. I like I like the the um, the map, the being in Italy, being in, in in that setting and that time period was really fun. But for me, I mean, I know a lot of people love Ezio, and he's a great character. But for me, he kind of reminds me. He's a little too um, he's a little too flamboyant for me. He's you know he's I'm an Ezio. He's very he's very lively, and <laughs> I like I just like very cold, you know, calculated killers. Um, and that's the delivery I got from Altair. Ezio is great as well, though, because of the way of the gameplay that came up from his game and, and from the different, you know, after that, he got like just the, the whole game was better than the first one because they improved upon all the little bugs that they had. And so gameplay wise, I think AC2 was my favorite. But in terms of character, definitely Altair. He was cool. All right. Okay, it's good that you mention uh, Ezio and sort of like how you felt about him as well, because obviously he had three games and um, he he had a lot of screen time and you know he. Uh, I think what what I'm trying to say is obviously, did you how how did you find or what were the challenges rather of following on from such a beloved character like Ezio? And again, we had one of the community questions from Anti Skeptic from Australia, um, who says, uh, did it feel daunting voicing the successor to a much loved character such as Ezio? You know, I thought about that a lot. I I know that everybody loves Ezio a lot, and I think I I do too because you know I've been we played three games with him, so it was he was our guy. He was he was the assassin. He was the person that we were you know pretending to be basically, and we get attached to that when you see that character over and over again. You you know you kind of just associate the two things. So I expected in a way people to kind of not really. Uh, warm up to Connor so quickly because his character is different. The way he talks and, and the way he is is not so of a charismatic, likable guy. He is, uh, to me, a more tragic character. Um, I mean, even though they both have their revenge things going on, but uh, I think, I don't know, uh, Ezio, he, he's just, I mean, he's the man. So, of course, I was feeling like I gotta, I gotta step into those shoes and, and own up to it. It was and continues to be kind of, um, I mean, I think about it. I hope that people can, can like Connor as much as they can. But he's different. It's like, I don't know, coffee and 7-Up. And you know, you got, you got <laughs> <laughs> what do you want to drink? You know what I mean? So it, it was tough. Yes, it was. And mm -hmm. But thankfully, I got to work with um, one of the mocap actors who, who did all of the body work for Ezio. Mm -hmm. And he basically, to me, was the other assassin because I never got to meet the other, you know, the guy who does the voice. And so we'd work together, and he'd do little things 
uh, like Ed Seal sometimes, the two-finger point that he always does, you know, he would do that, and, and it, it was really fun. So, yes, it was hard to follow Ed Seal. <laughs> <laughs> That's kind of interesting. Uh, you talk about the motion cap stuff. I was actually wondering, because um, I think starting with Revelations, I believe, they started doing facial capture for the dialogue as well. And when we were talking to Roger Craig Smith, um, who provides the voice of Ezio, he was talking about how difficult that was for him um, to kind of suddenly have, you know, all these cameras pointing in his face while he's trying to deliver these lines. And so I was wondering... Um, what exactly, obviously you did the voice for Connor, did you also do a lot of mocap for him? Was it just facial or was it total body mocap? And how was that experience for you, especially since you actually came from like a full-on acting background as opposed to Roger who was just doing voice work? All of the all of the cinematic sequence that you see that have acting in it, that's my body and my face and my movements. It's all captured. I was basically, I was up there for a good part of 2012. Every other month I'd be going up there for you know maybe 14 days at a time i think may i did 20 days we had a lot of cinematic sequences to do and it, i mean I, I spent a lot of time in a full mocap suit oh. doing his movements because to me oh. um, creating a character is about the way they move and the way they walk and the way they carry themselves says so much about who they are if somebody walks into a room with their shoulders hunched over and their head down, it's not as a commanding presence, whereas somebody walks in the room with the chest up and his shoulders back and his eyes straight up. And the way he picks up objects and the way he moves through a room says a lot about how who they are. And so I wanted to bring that to the motion capture. And the one thing that was challenging for me was that there, I mean, I'm not, I don't have problems with cameras at all, but uh, the helmet cam that they would put on me was, I mean, it was kind of a thing. It, 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 it was a camera that was positioned about five inches in front of my face and it was harnessed to the helmet itself. And so when you're trying to look somebody in the eye, there's, you got this little camera basically right in front of your face. And plus you're in the skin tight, like, wetsuit <laughs> so you just kind of automatically feel a little ridiculous yeah so you have to really you have to really pretend a lot more because you know if you play a cop say a show or something they give you the uniform they give you the shoes and like the shoes are important for an actor like for me anyway because it it, it helps you show how you walk around stuff and how you carry yourself says a lot about who you are so you got the cop belt on you got the badge on you got the hat you start to feel more like a cop than if you got you know a skin tight suit with balls all over it. So <laughs> uh, using the mocap suit was a little uh, was a challenging to me. But after you know the director made me feel comfortable in the space, which is very important. Uh, after he you know we worked through it, and I worked a couple times, I began to get real comfortable in that suit, and it just became you know my assassin suit. And I get in there, and I, you know, I do it. So a lot of the cinematic sequences are are my movements and my facial capture. I'd say, I don't know, ninety percent. Sometimes they did. They had somebody come in and do the body when I was doing voice in L.A. But I mean, I spent a lot of time in that suit. <laughs> <laughs> That's really interesting. Is this the first time that you've done kind of voiceover work as well? No, I've done. I've been doing vo- voiceover work a little bit. Um, I did a background voice for Red Dead Redemption. Oh. I, I've done I've done a lot of ADR on films. So say um, say when you do a scene for a movie and something happens with the sound, maybe it's a little weak, or we have some somebody some noise in the background, they'll have you come into a sound studio and you do your lines over again. So I have had experience working in a studio, but voiceover was not a, really a thing that I was looking for or trying to do as an actor. I mean, I want to do film and I want to do television. I want to do theater. That was kind of my thing. And, um, you know, I got a couple auditions here and there to do voice things. And, you know, I t- I'll take them because, you know, it's a job. It's work. So, uh, yeah, but this is really it, – it, it was a newer thing to do voice. But, again, it wasn't – for me, it wasn't so much uh, just voice. I mean, I felt like every time I worked for them, I was doing movement as well. It wasn't just the, just the voice. I mean, we had few voice sessions down here in, in L.A., but they'd still put the helmet cam on me inside the uh, – inside the booth so Mm -hmm. was constantly on camera and you know so yeah yeah Yeah, i found it really interesting you were bringing up earlier when we were talking about um Ezio and how different connor is from him 
Um, and it's true that that you know they both have their tragedies, but but Connor's is, is very different uh, in a lot of ways too. And so I was really hoping in this podcast to kind of really do a kind of a deep. I, I really was curious about your understanding of Connor's character and kind of how it influenced your um, performance, um, kind of how you understood him to be as a person. And so, um, Gio, did you want to start us up on that? Yeah. Uh, um, I was just wondering, did you have any particular inspiration for Connor, like uh, any person in your life or just, uh, or was it just a compilation of different things? Oh, the way he's, the way he speaks um, was, uh, I remember seeing a, a movie called Last of the Mohicans when I was really young. Like, I can't remember. And uh, one of my favorite characters in, in that movie is Mog- Mogwai. I think his name is Mogwai. Mm-hmm. He's, the, he's the bad native that works for the Redcoats. And there was, a, there was a scene where he's in battle and the battle had just ended and the Redcoat commander comes up to him and says, Mogwai, after, after you find the White Eye Man, what are you going to do? Or whatever his name is. What are you going to do with it? And he looks at him and he goes... When Magua finds him, Magua will eat his heart. And it was just... <laughs> yeah, this guy is, it wasn't like angry. It wasn't just like, you know, I'm going to eat his heart and I'm going to kill him. It was just very <laughs> like... Now, this is what's going to happen. I'm going to find him. I'm going to kill him. I'm going to eat his heart. And I was like, wow, this guy is just stone cold killer. And I kind of touched on that when I remembered it. I mean, I wanted to have that seriousness and that focus behind him, but not the evilness. So I kind of used, tried to use a little bit of that. And and then also my family and looking at elders and different pictures from my tribe and the, the way that they, you know, carry themselves and stuff, the way they talk. Uh, his language, he's, a, he's second. It's his second language. English is his second language. So I wanted to, I wanted to sound, you know, when people speak English, they try to make it correct um, instead of having slurs and slangs, uh, saying things like couldn't, wouldn't, shouldn't, uh, can't. Mm-hmm. It would become I should not, I could not, I cannot to, to, to try and speak proper English in a way. Um, and it slows it down. It makes it a little bit more um, direct. And I think that. It's kind of more in the vein of, of Connor. Um, but, yeah, that's kind of how I built him. And then and then also I, I, I had to take into account that it was a game. That I'm also kind of being the player. You know, when we play games, we become our character. We, we kind of take the shoes of the character because we're driving them through the scenes. So to me, it's kind of like a little interactive movie. You know, you you, you guys are playing. The gamer is the kind of the main character of the movie or of the story. So I had to have a little bit of that in it as well. You know, when when Connor's running all over the world and then you know he's going from here to there, it's like as a gamer, you're like, well, I just came over here to do this, and now you're telling me to do this, and now I have to go kill this guy. I mean, come on, what do you, what do you want me to do? <laughs> carry right. some of that to the game too when 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 it's when it's appropriate. Um, but yeah, I mean, that's, that's basically, that's basically it there. Well, thank you. So, uh, you talk about driving Connor's character through as like the gamer, but like, did it, I was wondering if any facet of Connor's personality resonate with you as a person, like on your own, like, uh, Kelsey Johnson and Scan Links were both wondering from the community members, were both wondering along the same line. They asked, what's one thing you could compare yourself to Connor with? Is there something about his personality that really clicked it for you? Um, well, the one thing that's really similar is that our backgrounds are the same or very similar. His mother is native, his father is English. My father is from English um, ancestors. He comes from Cornwall. Uh, and uh, my mother is Blackfeet and Crow. So in that respect, it was really close, right on. Um, kind of caught between two worlds, not really accepted by either sometimes. Um, but, uh, I mean, that's a, that's a tough one. It, he comes from a different, totally different time period. And I, I don't know if our personalities... Are, are are very much aligned at all. I mean, I, I feel, I guess, the seriousness of, of what I of how I act sometimes, but it depends on who I'm with. You know, I think I think Connor has a lot is a lot more of a noble person than I am. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 
And I don't think he'd be, you know, I, I just I just think his, his integrity and, and, and what he stands for and the situations that he's been in, I could never really understand that. You know, I, I never had my whole family burned alive and killed. I never had, I, I, I've never killed anybody. I, I wouldn't, you know, so we're just different in that respect. Um, yeah. But in terms of our background, we're very similar. You know? It's funny that you mentioned that about um, Connor, you know, what he goes through as a child, because I think that's a large part of, it, it shapes so much of his character, right? And it, it's kind of the difference between Ezio and Connor. Ezio goes through tragedy. He has half of his family hanged in front of him, and that's pretty traumatic for him. But at the same time, it's he is already, you know, he's already a, pretty much a man at that point. You know, he has young love. He spent time with his family. Um, Connor experiences all of his tragedy when he's around five years old or so. And then it, it just keeps coming after that, like as an adult as well. Yeah. But to to be kind of robbed of um, both your village, even though it's kind of rebuilt, um, but you're having your mother kind of burned in front of you, I think really informs a lot. I think a lot of people that talk about, um, you know, how different he is from Ezio and it's, you got to kind of remember that all these events that happen this early on in kind of a child's development really affect exactly. how they are later exactly. on. Exactly. You're, you're hitting it right on. Yeah. I watched, I was playing through the game in that part when the, he, you know, he gets strangled mm. and then they leave him for, you know, they just leave him and then he, you have to run back to his village. And it really hit me because, I mean, I've been hearing those kind of stories since I'm little about things like massacres and things that happen to, to not just, say, Mohawks, but a lot of indigenous people around the world have gone through that kind of thing and when the kid was running back when little connor was running back and he was screaming his mom's name or screaming for his you know his family the little kid screaming just really like i don't know it hit it struck a chord it was like it was very sad and you're trying you know you're over there hitting the x button trying to lift up this thing that you can't possibly lift up and yeah that scene was really that scene was really tough to watch for me because I feel a connection with that you know with those type of massacres that happened like I was looking at it, I was like this is kind of like what happened like this is in a way what it would look like you know some some guys walking down and he's on fire and he's like screaming and falling over and then you know your mom's in there and she's telling you go I love you it's like wow this is just the beginning crap. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. What did I right. sign myself up for? I learned on. It was just yeah. extremely sad. And and that to me, when I, you know, when I when I was here, you know, knowing the script, I knew that already. I knew that he had had that, but to have it presented in front of me afterwards and see it was a, was also a big jump. And that that childhood like you're talking about, what happens as a young young per- person that forms who you are. And I took that into account when I was creating the character. Mm-hmm. This person has seen his mom burn alive in front of her, in front of him. And, you know, I don't know if you're going to be a happy, go lucky, cheery person for the rest <laughs> of your life after something like that, yeah. you know? So indeed that, that does shape his, shape his, the way he talks and the way he is. And yeah. it's not, not necessarily as likable, but I feel that it has truth in it. Absolutely. And I think it's very telling. You see throughout the game, he like, he pr- almost never smiles. I think the only point I remember him really smiling is in during the Homestead missions, actually, um, when he learns of Norris and Miriam's wedding, or his, their engagement. Yeah. And he's, he does kind of like a little bit of a smile there, and I found that really... I was really kind of touched by that, I think. I think the Homestead missions are really... It's kind of the only part of Connor's life where he kind of starts, you know starts actually carving out like a nice little uh you know something for himself out of everything hope. yeah he's got hope. some sort of hope going on for him yeah and i think it's very telling that his smiles are so rare and it's like kind of has a lot of impact when he does it whereas you know a character like Ezio is still kind of the same person he was before um before his family was killed just now he has purpose but you know his Ezio's smirk is almost like an iconic part of his character you know what i mean and yeah just, yeah it's just such a part of who he was before and who he continues to be, even th- as he gets older and wiser. Um, it's still a part of him, whereas Connor is just growing up. And I, I think it's it's really interesting because it's not as relatable and it's not as as happy-go-lucky. I mean, I think kind of everyone who plays Ezio kind of 
you know, the guys want to be him and the girls want to be with him, right? The right. Because <laughs> he's like a charming ladies' man. With him. And then you have Connor, and I think it's... I thought it was very interesting. I found the story really compelling, even though it was is much less relatable and also just kind of very tragic, very tragic character. Yeah, I mean, I, I think there was a joke by Charlie Hill, a, a famous native comedian. He's like, "Why you Indians? You're always so serious. I mean, you you don't you you know what you you don't laugh or what's going on?" And it's like, "Well, we don't find you two very funny either." You know? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's like, I mean. The, kind of a, I guess, not a stereotype or generalization about being a kind of a stoic Indian, but I, I mean, that didn't have it. That wasn't in it for me. It was the reason why it was that was because of his, his history. I have lots of relatives who are jokesters, and you know, they're laughing and they're they're boisterous, and they're not stereotypical stoic Indian on the prairie, brave Tonto, you know, thing. <laughs> <laughs> it's just. It's just part of Connor, you know. I mean, you yeah. could have done you could have done a, a Connor version where his parents weren't murdered or his mom wasn't murdered in front of him, and he would have a total. I mean, I think he would have a total different uh, disposition in the way he is. Yeah. So, I mean, you're right. He's not he's not as accessible. It's hard to understand, and, and to put yourself in his shoes because you can't relate. It's hard for people to relate to that unless you are a native, unless you have been to you know these kind of things in this history. And, you know, so, yeah, I, I, I see that. I get that. And it's, I think it's, we're moving beyond this, the game, you know. It's just we're trying to say something here. We're trying to, trying to uh, comment on, on our history a little bit. Whereas I felt that the previous Assassin's Games had history, but it was a little bit more about stabbing people in the face and running around and having fun <laughs> as opposed to giving a real, like, this tragic thing going on here. It's just, it's. A, I think it's a much sadder story. And then what happened to the Native Americans is is really terrible. And and you know, I mean, it was genocide basically. And it's still fresh. It's still very fresh for us. Yeah. And um, I think that's why. I mean, it's it's an it's a subject that people don't like to bring up and it like to tiptoe around because you know it's like if it's like Germans talking about what happened in in the in world war ii you know it's it's a touchy subject for people so i think that's kind of where where that comes from in a way i don't know yeah yeah so you've talked about your heritage um we actually had a community question from b bus from new england um who you've kind of answered this but there's a little bit more that he's asking about he asks uh, many people tend to lump all native american nations and cultures into one identity but this is not accurate and so he was wondering if you could tell us a little bit about your background and possibly some distinct differences between your culture and the mohawk culture well i uh, the crow uh, I'm, I'm crow up uh, uh, the name of our tribe is absaluka which which is crow which is translated to the crow crows and uh i i, I grew up off of a reservation, I didn't live, I wasn't born and live on a reservation. I lived about two, hour and a half away. A lot of my family, mom's family lives on the res. And um, so I'd go back, I'd go there to visit family throughout the year, as particularly for uh, a powwow called Crow Fair. It happens the third week of August every year. And it's uh, one of the larger in teepee, teepee encampments in the world. They set up somewhere between 700 teepees, 800 teepees. There's a rodeo, and it's just a giant powwow for about a week, and you camp out, and and I was also, or I am a traditional crow war dancer, so I participate in dances, and um, I've been doing that since I was a little kid, six, five, I think, and um, I would do sweats, I, I would participate in different ceremonies, but... I didn't ever do a sun dance or I never have done UEP ceremonies or peyote ceremonies or anything. So I haven't really gone into that, but I have been immersed around it and I've had family that do that. So I understand it, know what goes on in, into it. Um, Mohawks are, they're East Coast Indians. They don't live in teepees. They live in longhouses. Um, they're just, you know, they're they're closer to those type of Indians. I, my brother-in-law, my sister married a, a Pequot, I think his his tribe is, and they, the way they wear their their garments and their their outfits, they don't have a, a tail feathers or a bustle. So he'd come to Crow Fair and he'd uh, he'd dance, and and a lot of the crows would look at him and go, "Where's this bustle at?" You know, because his outfit looked different. So they they are distinctly different. The language is very different. Um, 
some words in Crow would be like Ish Balachbaga, Yiddishish. It's different than in, than Kanangecha, you know. Yeah. Uh, so, I, I mean, it's just. It's like I mean, there's so many tribes on 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 the United States and the North America, and they all have different languages, and different ceremonies, and different ways of life. Um, the problem is, is that movies from Hollywood, from you know, John Wayne movies, John Ford movies, they would shoot Indians all kind of wearing the same outfits. Even if they were in the Southwest, they would be wearing big war bonnets. And they would look like Plains Indians, which is where which is where Crows and Sioux and Lakotas are from. Right. So it kind of generalized all Indians. And I don't think I mean I think that's something that movies kind of have done to natives throughout you know history of cinema. And um, it's getting better now because we're getting we're getting natives making their own movies, and people are paying more attention to detail and to to fact. AC did that with. Uh, with hiring consultants, and so they brought Mohawks and taught me a lot about the culture and and about the language, and it was uh, it was di- I mean it was very different. So there are distinct differences, and it's good that people need to know that. I mean, because I've run into a lot of people who think that all Indians speak the same language, and it's just ridiculous. You know? <laughs> yeah. So you're talking about uh, just kind of like a follow-up question on this, actually, from the community. We had one from someone called the, v- the V Gamer, who asked, um, "Seeing as how you are a Native American, a profound area of ignorance for most people, how well did you think Ubisoft represented the whole culture and Connor's character?" I think they did a great job. They and they were they were very um, attentive to the consultants and the people they hired to to make sure that it, uh, the stories were correct. I remember they wanted to do something with some sort of masks or something, and um, the Mohawk said, "Then you know you can't use that. That's a special ceremony. That's something that we don't want used." And they didn't use it. Um, the language they paid attention to the language. They, t- I mean, they did a whole sequence in Mohawk, pretty much. Yep. So I mean, that's just great. And the whole fact that they even chose a native to play this character is a big step. You know, really big step. And I think. My hats off to them. I'm very thankful that they've done this, and they did a great job. Yeah, there, uh, we had another community question from Potza Butterfly in Chicago, who um, followed up with that, asking, "Is there anything you would have changed or added?" This is regarding the portrayal of, of Native Americans in AC3. The portrayal? Um, no, I mean it's not my place to do that. Uh, I, I wouldn't have done that. I wouldn't want to do that. Um, <laughs> I guess Definitely if you're not, not Mohawk, it would be kind of weird to be like, oh. Yeah. <laughs> it's like a so German much. person saying, that's not right about, uh, you know, Mexican culture. I, I, yeah. Yeah, how, where am I to, how am I to speak on that? Mm-hmm. But I do can, can speak for indigenous people. I mean, I think that's kind of what it, what it would be. And, and no, I wouldn't change anything about it. And, and I'm, you know, I'm glad that they hired the consultant so that, you know, I was, I was secure in knowing that I wasn't, you know, doing something that was... Uh, offensive to the Mohawks, you know, because I don't, I didn't know their culture when I got involved in it. I didn't know about their, what, how they, you know, how they structure their societies and stuff. And it was very comforting to me to know that, you know, Dave would be like, yeah, we, we've been talking to consultants and everything and it's all good. Everything's, everything's on a thing and, and it's all truthful and don't worry about it. And I was like, all right, good. They've done their homework and I don't need to stress out about that. So I'll just do my job as an actor and try to, try to bring it through. Yeah, and so we were talking. You were talking earlier about the uh, the different languages and how they're all different and everything. And, and Geo, I'm sorry to cut you off earlier. <laughs> you had a question about that, I think. Um, yeah, there was that article that came out called uh, "Playing Assassin's Creed Three on the Pine Ridge Reservation," which, um, although it was a, a Lakota reservation, the author of that article said that all of the people that played it there. They were really mostly enthusiastic about the language being spoken, the Mohawk language. And he is quoted as saying um, that they said the most uncontroversial and unadulterated good for um, Native representation is the revival of Native language. Um, I was just curious, uh, how much pressure did you feel to speak the Mohawk accurately, and what are your feelings about language being a good representation of Native people in general? Um... That was tough. That was a really tough thing to learn that language and and to speak it. it you know, 
it's it's such a beautiful language and I don't want to butcher it. Uh, I you know I try to speak German with my wife and she's like you know that's wrong it's totally wrong you know it's it, when you're trying to learn how to do do a language in in a short amount of time it's like what <laughs> i mean you you can't truly sound like you've been speaking it for 20 years so you got to do your you know you do your best um what was the second half of the question i'm sorry um what is uh, what are your feelings about uh the revival of native language being um good or not good perhaps for native representation oh, wonderful it's got to be. It's got. I mean, that's the whole thing. If we don't, we start start losing our language, and you know, we start slipping away bits of our culture and who we are. So I think it's 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 very important, and I think tribes are making a, an effort to do that. I know that the they're starting to write down a lot of their their languages, and they're starting to teach it and have classes in schools. Also, there is a. I think it's called Rosetta Stone. You guys familiar with that? Mm -hmm. Yep. Uh, I think yeah. Navajo has been put in as a language that you can learn from that and that's really awesome so i i i mean i i think we're coming we're indians natives are coming back and, and we're, we're coming back from this what happened to us i think there was a, a i don't know somewhere around 250 270,000 in the early 1900s that was that's what it went down to we were almost extinct in north america and and you know from from low estimate of 30 million natives on the on the on the continent before Europeans came in, down to two hundred fifty thousand. And now we're we're getting our numbers back up again. And through that we need to be, you know, still in touch with the ceremonies and the culture. And language is a big part of that. And so I really I'm glad and happy that they have included this and are making an effort to show how important it is and how special it is and how beautiful it is. Yeah, that's great. Um, Andy, I think you also had some stuff to talk about with the language as well. Yes, regarding the languages, you mentioned earlier that the language that they speak in the game is different from your own native Crow language. And Alfred L. in Canada was wondering if was it difficult to get all the pronunciations correct and did you need a vocal co coach? Yes. I don't know if you guys, have you seen the, there's a behind the Assassin's Creed 3 um, there's four of them or five of them, little little movies, 15 minute movies, something like that. And there's one where you see me speaking the language. Uh, there was a guy sitting right next to me, like saying everything. Like I'd say the I'd say the line, and then he'd uh, ah, that's not it, and then he'd say it for me, and then I have to repeat him, and he'd say it again, and then I had to repeat him. Then I had to get uh, I they the way it's written down is not how it look or the way it looks is not how it sounds at all. <laughs> So I'm trying to read it, and it's like this: the K's become like G's, kind of, and the T's become like D's. So I had to basically rewrite all in phonetics for myself. So it was a, it was probably the toughest thing about about the whole about the whole process. I feel a lot of pressure to get it right, and it was uh, it was a good it was a good experience by far. Something that I noticed, like while playing the game, was that like Connor, when speaking his native language, seemed a little more soft-spoken than when he was speaking in English. Was that a conscious decision that you made for his character, or just like a facet of the language itself? Uh, I mean, no, I, I wasn't consciously. I, I don't remember thinking about it like that. <laughs> <laughs> so no, no, no. It might be more that he's rarely angry. He's, he doesn't get quite as angry with the other people as he does when he's looking for Charles Lee. <laughs> <laughs> Where is Charles Lee? <laughs> um, so actually, talking about Connor's voice and, and acting, um, I thought it was very interesting because um, in the previous games, uh, you know, especially with the Ezio games, uh, the Animus was translating the Italian. And so Desmond would be hearing things in English, and then every once in a while, um, one word might slip through in Italian, you know, it's like bastardo or you know, whatever. Um, but I, th I found it kind of interesting because in AC3, uh, this is actually the first time that Desmond is hearing, the, the animus doesn't need to translate when Connor and everyone else is speaking English. And so theoretically, you're hearing everything as it was being said and not some kind of animus translation for that. Um, and I also thought it was kind of interesting that the animus suddenly doesn't translate Mohawk anymore. And I'm guessing, and I don't know if you have any insight into this at all, uh, Noah, um, 
as mm-hmm. to if that was just like a decision to help preserve kind of respect the culture or you know kind of just take some narrative license with that or anything like that um, yeah no I, I i didn't uh i didn't i didn't notice that actually what you're talking about the animus translating um so i couldn't i couldn't touch on that uh for you but um yeah i i, I really don't i really don't know i mean Seems to me like maybe some respect might be thrown in there for that reason, but uh, I, I couldn't say. Yeah, I'm guessing that's probably what it was. But it also means, you know, that you're hearing Connor speak, and English is his, is a second language for him, right? And so mm-hmm. um, I was wondering, you kind of touched on this earlier, but I was wondering if you could go into a little more detail about how that aspect of Connor's character affected how you, how you formed his voice for it, and kind of just that aspect of it. Yeah, well, I mean, the the character Mogwai, uh, they had that, that actor Wes Studi. He's a he's a cool he's an actor that I worked with before, and he's Cherokee, and I think he he spoke Cherokee before he spoke English, and that way of speaking, like in that character, just kind of set a set a tone for me. Like I was like, that's kind of it, it felt right for me. So mm-hmm. I wanted it to be not as sinister as that but deliberate and focused and paying attention to saying things correctly you know um enunciating the words more so than saying things like can't do it won't do it shouldn't do it uh you know it's more of a lazy sound when you speak like that um so it was deliberately done that way so that i would sound more focused more precise and more to the point of what I want and where am I going? What's my objective? Who do I have to stab in the face next? <laughs> <laughs> yes. Very Most important part. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I thought it was also kind of interesting because there was also a, the, an interview with Alex Hutchinson, the creative director, over the summer where he was talking about accents. And he basically said something, I'm kind of paraphrasing, but something along the lines of, like, it's really hard to do a Native American accent without it sounding, sounding stereotypical. Because Connor doesn't really, he doesn't really have an, an accent when he speaks, right? And I was the, native, if... the native accent you're talking about, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Like, are you talking about Tonto speak? Or yeah, are you talking pretty about much, I think. Red... I think that's pretty much what um, <laughs> Alex was probably referring to. Uh, I was wondering if you could touch on that a little bit. Maybe if you guys had even explored using an accent for, for Connor before or kind of that whole process. Well, the the one of the things I was I was kind of making up for my own history as Connor was that he was taught to speak English by proper speaking you know English speakers, um, and so I think that's kind of where where it came from. But if you listen to the way uh, na- natives talk on reservations, there is an accent there, but it's it's not a Tonto accent; it's a Res accent. Um, oh, uh, it's like. Over there or over there? Where, where are you going? Oh, I'm going over to the store. Oh, okay. <laughs> I'll see you when you come back. All right. Oh, okay. Later. You know, it's it's mm. it's a res accent. Whereas Tonto speaks more like this. He's <laughs> I am B B big Indian. You bad white man. I'm coming. To- <laughs> so Doesn't like hate a- them try something like that on Zio? Yeah. Yeah, like, yeah, Why yeah. are you talking to me like that? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I did think that was yeah, a really yeah. nice touch. <laughs> See, and that's that's another thing that was funny when she when he comes in when Hatham comes in and goes, I come in peace. <laughs> and she's all, Why are you speaking, speaking. so slowly? <laughs> it was like I was. I mean, that's it right there. I mean, it's Tonto speak came from Hollywood, you know. So that's where it comes from. I movies, you know. So not how we speak, and I I think the accent wise. I wanted it to make it, uh, you know, like that, slow and deliberate and trying to enunciate. And, um, you know, that's what I did when I came into the audition. That's what that's the choice I made before I even got on set. That's the choice I made when I was, le- you know, learning the lines. I, uh, I recorded them on, on, on GarageBand and I played them back through my iPod uh, on the way to the, on the way to the, the audition. And, when I got hired for the role and where I was in Canada, you know, getting ready to work and they're talking about, you know, this and that. It's like, well, look, man, I was talking to Dave. It's like, I'm not going to, you know, you guys hired me to do what I was doing in the audition. That's what I'm going to do. You know, that you guys liked, obviously, what I did. You you auditioned, I don't know how many people and you guys chose me. So that's what I'm going to stick to, you know. So I just kind of st- stuck to that. 
it's it's interesting. You were we were talking about Haytham earlier, and Haytham is obviously well. He's become a, quite a popular character, I think, in the in the AC community. But he's also such an important part of Connor's character as well. You know, he's kind of the absent father, the absent father figure that throughout the course of the game, Connor starts to kind of. He he kind of tries to reconcile with him a little bit, but I think he also kind of it's, it's it just kind of adds to the tragic weight of Connor's character because he's pretty much fated to to clash with him and you know eventually kill him. Um, yeah. And uh, we had a question. The second highest voted question from the community um, is from someone whose name I would completely butcher if I tried to pronounce it. So I'm just going to call him Gregors. Um, and he asks, <laughs> um, "How did you like Connor's interactions with his father?" They're, I mean, the actor was fun, great. Adrian was really cool to work with. And, you know, it's... It, he, Hatham is a very kind of uh, snobby. He kind of feels a little snobby. Like, he just knows it all. It's not, you know, very... <laughs> I know what's best, son, and I'm going to do what I'm going to do, and you're going to follow me. Now. Go and do what I tell you to do. And so it's... So it was, it was very like kind of like a little banter between us on set and stuff, and I I mean we would make Star Wars jokes, you know, I am a father, you know, things like that. <laughs> nice. You no, know, we're fated to that. It's a kind of a same kind of a situ- similar situation. I gotta go, you know, I gotta fight my father. Eventually, we're gonna have to, you know, we're gonna have to brawl, buddy. So mm-hmm. we'll see what happens. Um, it was great. I mean, it was great working with him, and I, I, I love, uh, I love his his delivery and the way he is. It, it, it. What it does is it adds a dynamic, you know, to to the relationship. I'm, we're not just the same guy, you know. It, it makes my character more serious if he's like that, you know. In 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 any kind of comedy situation as well, you have the straight guy who plays normal, and then you have the guy who's kind of off the wall and bonkers, and, and the <laughs> dynamics. Between those two is what makes an interesting relationship. And I think that was kind of what was fun about our scenes is that, I mean, Connor's super serious and he's kind of a, Haytham's a little bit more playful guy. So it was really great to work with him. Mm -hmm. Definitely. Yeah. Gio, you had something, you were wondering something along the lines of that as well, I think. Yeah. um, Well, my first question was, did you work with him? And obviously, yes, you confirm that. Um, uh, did you guys do the mocap stuff together, or was it just the voice acting, like in a booth, or um, in no, the? No, we, we, we were both mocap oh, okay, together. Ahead. Yeah. So we had we had um, um, we had full suits on. We did scenes together. Uh, I don't know. We did. I don't know. Maybe a couple days, four days, maybe. Um, separate, two separate, different occasions. I think. Um, so there was a lot. There was a lot of time together on set, and uh, we went out for dinner. A couple of, of the actors went, went out afterwards, and he's a really cool guy. I mean, had a lot of fun. Uh, it was, some of my favorite scenes are with uh, with Haytham, um, for sure. Uh, okay, yeah, that that was gonna be the 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 next part of my question was, did you enjoy those scenes? I think that's like the entirety of sequence nine when they team up and do all that stuff. That's just how you felt yeah. about those scenes. Oh, really great. I mean, he's a he's a great guy. And the uh, the like I say the dynamics between the two is fun. And um it's the idea, the situation is pretty pretty heavy. You know, so it's always great. It's always fun to do that. I I much prefer to to work with another actor in person because it's um one of my earlier acting teachers told me that it's a lot about your reactions when you work. It's about not not about how you feel and how you what your dilemma is and what you're going through, but about how you affect that other person with what you say and how that person affects you with what they say. And so when you get on a set with another actor who's trained, who's been on stage, who's done films, who understands these ideas, you guys can start to play off of each other and it makes it makes the situation and the scene a lot more interesting to watch, and uh, I will always prefer to work with another actor and and do it like that instead of listening to his voice over the thing and then trying to react off that because I'm not getting facial expressions, I'm not getting movements, I'm not getting gestures. Mm-hmm. You know, the tiniest little movement of of your of your body in certain certain ways can say so much about what you're thinking underneath your lines. So. Yes, I I really enjoyed working with Haytham and uh, Adrian. So speaking of working with the other with the other team members on AC three, uh, Criso from Ireland was wondering if you had any humorous moments while working on Connor, if there were any like bloopers on set. 
Yeah, there, I mean, there was a point. There was okay. Well, there's one point where there was a scene between. Uh, I think it. I can't remember, but it was a, like a kissing scene. I, it had nothing to do with me. I was just watching, <laughs> and there was there was like there, there was no woman on set that day to do the mocap. <laughs> so they had a guy, like a, a short guy, to the, do the woman and the man, and like so they had to like you know fake kiss and stuff and that. I got a lot of laughs. You know, two guys in suits <laughs> hugging doing a scene but you're actors you know you do what you got to do um the one time that was pretty funny for me when i was working was uh another actor i mentioned earlier who plays the body of uh Ezio in in the games he does all he did all the mocap for the for the body i walked into the scene you know and I, he's sitting at the table and he's got this move like the way he's holding himself and the way he's moving it's just like exactly like Ezio and then he opens his mouth and starts talking and it was like in the Ezio voice because the voice is not getting recorded on that day you know somebody else is going to dub over what he's doing so he's sitting there starting to talk like Ezio at me and I'm like about halfway through the scene I'm like he's doing it like in my head i'm like he's doing etsy on me god dang it so i like put my connery because i know he's been Ezio for a while doing his body motions and stuff and it was it was kind of funny because he was trying to he's trying to crack me you know sometimes when you work with actors and you get fun you have fun they do stuff or you do stuff to the other actor to try and break them in the scene to make them laugh or smile <laughs> and he was trying to get that to me. thankfully i got through it though i didn't break but afterwards it was big it was like what are you doing? Stop that. <laughs> it's distracting. <laughs> did you ever feel like when you were recording Connor's lines, because Connor's just like always so serious, did you ever feel like you personally would start slipping into like making jokes as Connor and stuff to kind of lighten it after a while or, or anything? Oh, like definitely. That? Yeah. Like after after the scene's done and then, you know, we're, we're two actors or, you know, two, two characters are just at each other's throat and, you know, are we yeah. saying something? And then, you know, say they say cut, and then I say something else in the line. You know, something ridiculous as Connor to to lighten it up because he he is he is so very serious. And actors just most most of the time, actors are very playful. You know, they pretend for a living. So that's what they do. Yeah. <laughs> Play around. <laughs> so it's always kind of you know, it's keep the th- keep the situation lively. Um, but when there are when there are really dramatic scenes, and there are they're very intense. Um, I tr- I I try not to joke around when that ha- when those things come around because I want to keep the feeling in the room like that. That if everybody keeps if everybody keeps the situation and looking at the situation like it means a lot and that that it is very important or it is a very important thing. If everybody around in the room is sending that energy out and feeling that then it helps me slip into that to that moment a lot better but you know those 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 serious intense moments come are are few and far between when you really have to you know have that type of atmosphere on the set most of the time it's lively and fun and actors get along with each other that's great okay so why don't we move on um this is a pair of questions from the community that I'm also very interested in hearing. Um, so we'll, we'll direct these at you first, Noah, but then we can also go around and share. Um, Sarah N. from Malaysia was wondering, uh, what's your favorite Connor line? And then Anna Katarina from Oporto, Portugal was also wondering, what was your favorite scene of the game? And so we'll start with you, Noah. Favorite scene and or line, and then we can kind of go around if anybody wants to contribute. I will not die today. The same cannot be said for you. <laughs> that was that's a good one that's a very yeah, good one because it was, it was yeah. just like what uh, it's not not angry it's just matter of fact like when dave told me to do it he's like mm. you know it's just matter of fact man you're gonna kill him it's over <laughs> 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 um favorite scene uh i i mean there's a lot of them i like the end scene uh with with lee um yeah. i i, I not much was said, but you know I like that. Uh, the scenes with Haytham. I mean, there's a lot of them that I liked. I couldn't. I couldn't pinpoint it down. My favorite. I mean, the one that really hit me the most. The one I wasn't even in it, but the the when the little boy is running back to his village and it's burning. That that I, I had to stop for a second, and and it it, 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 bo- it bothered me, but not in a bad way. It was like, man, that was really that was really right on. <laughs> it was very sad and. That moment was was a was a big point in the game for me when I was playing it during the game when I was acting. I'd say a lot of the stuff with Haytham. Cool. Does anybody else want to 
chime in on their favorite lines and uh, yeah uh, so by my, my favorite line and and one of the um voted questions from the community from George de Muerte in England as well I my favorite bit is when you say repeatedly where is Charles Lee <laughs> I was hoping you could uh, do that for us <laughs> on the podcast <laughs> where is Charles Lee <laughs> yeah, that, that was good. That was good. <laughs> he has, a, I feel like he has a bunch of variations of it too. He's like, "Where is Charles Lee?" Like, you know, it's like throughout the game. It's it's increasingly Lee. impatient. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Gets more Got from inquisitive sense. to angry, right? Yeah. Where, where yeah. is Charles Lee? Where is Charles Lee? <laughs> <laughs> yes, exactly. And then at the end, he's just he does that that line where he's like, like, like screaming, Batman. Like, yeah. <laughs> Give me Lee. <laughs> yeah. Give me oh, Lee. give me Lee! Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah that, 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 scene, that scene in the end when we're fi- uh, we're fighting the house is burning down. Yeah, that was yeah. Where are you? Where are you, Charles? Yeah, I remember that. Yeah, it was... <laughs> yeah it's really interesting because like I, I I really like Connor's angry voice. I, I feel like I I really love what you've done with it. Um, whenever he gets really angry, he's looking for Charles Lee or anything else. Like it's always kind of like, oh shit! Like somebody's gonna get killed. Like, <laughs> you know, like it's like even even that um that Captain Kid mission where where Connor goes to the ship, the ship that's been wrecked. Like and and he's like just going after this piece of map, but somebody gets there before him, and he's like, "What you have is mine." Or I can't remember the exact line, but yeah. something like that. And he's like yelling, and I'm just like, "Holy shit!" And I'm just imagining the guy taking the map. It's just like, "Holy shit, what's going on?" Oh my god! Like, why? <laughs> I just came here for some treasure. Why is there a crazy like guy chasing me across the room? So he's like yelling at me. <laughs> like, but, Psychopath with a hatchet. What are you doing with my phone? Ah! Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, um, I was actually kind of curious, um, kind of how you. See, uh, there were some community questions. I can't. I don't remember where they are right now. But they were kind of asking, like, how you kind of psych yourself up for Connor's like angry voice and those kind of scenes and everything. Um, before before I do before I do that, I I uh, I have a couple warm up uh, monologues that I do. Um, one is the uh, one the Conqueror Worm from from Edgar Allan Poe, which is a very dark poem. And the other is a monologue from from a a play, a one man show called "Pounding no- Nail Pounding Nails in the Floor with My Forehead." And there's like it's a really, I mean, it's a great title. But the 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 first scene is uh, the first monologue is a is a crazy guy on a train who's you know insane, and he, he starts off. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, homeboys and homeless. Welcome to the Soul Train. And so I just really infuse a huge a lot of energy in my voice and you know i work myself up i stand i gotta get to a place where i'm alone nobody's around uh i like to smack things hit things you know uh, smack my fists together um, get my body worked up move around i can't just go from zero to ten like uh because you can hurt your voice you can hurt all your other you know you can do something wrong so you got to put yourself in that kind of emotional state every actor has their own thing that they do you know um but that's kind of what i do uh i try to take other pieces other monologues that have an anger or have a some sort of emotion that's similar to what i'm about to portray and do that uh right right before cool uh, Gio or Andy, do you guys have a favorite moment or line? Uh, I'd say um, my favorite line was during the Homestead mission when he's trying to help Norris hit on the Huntress. <laughs> he's like, no, wait, I got this, I got this. And then he goes to Prudence and he's like, so, you're a woman. What is it that women like? Because I have no idea. <laughs> that was my well, favorite. Yeah. Connor's not quite the ladies' man. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yeah, it's he, um, he he. I remember asking Corey about this, like about the character's history. I'm like, so, so where's you know, like halfway through, I'm like, so where's like his, where's his wife, where's his woman, and uh, what, what what's going on with his relationships? And he and Corey, I think Corey was like, nah, he's a virgin. He's a virgin. Yeah, that's it. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure Except, there were many people who wanted to know that fact. <laughs> I don't know. I don't. I don't. I think he might have been just joking with me or something. I don't know. But uh, there is no mention of 
him having a relationship as far as my knowledge goes. I don't know. Have you guys heard it? Seen anything? He has any, a conversation any? with the other people on the homestead later, yeah. like the two the other bachelor bachelors. Party. Yes. Yeah. He's, he just tells them like he doesn't have time to devote to make sure that the girl would be happy. So he can't like indulge in a relationship right now. Okay. Okay. I think I remember that. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, well, see, he's got work to do. He's just busy, busy, busy. Yeah. <laughs> There's also that conversation he has with one of the um, assassin recruits um, from the Liberation Missions. Dobby. Yeah, um, and yeah, Gio, you could probably elaborate on this better than I remember. Um, but um, oh, I don't even remember. Like, Dobby says something like, if he wasn't so busy, like, she would definitely, like, get with him or something like some Something along those lines yeah. to be... Uh, yeah, paraphrase I think, like that. yeah i think it's basically like she asks him what happens after all this is done and he's kind of like oh you know i would like i i, I might be completely paraphrasing messing this up but i think he says something along the lines of he kind of wants a family and stuff right yeah so kind of yeah into that. and then she's basically like yeah. she's like well you know she doesn't say in that voice but <laughs> well. she's like she's like well that, like promise me like you'll you'll keep me in mind first or <laughs> like, yes, I'll, I'll get first that. crack at you. Yeah, like, ah. like, call me. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Here's my number. <laughs> yeah, and I think he actually does. He does. I think he agrees to that, right? He's basically like, I will, basically. Uh, yeah. So I thought it was kind of interesting. You know, you get kind of hints of it, but I think uh, overall through the conversations, I think yeah. it definitely supports Corey's <laughs> blunt <laughs> assessment of Connor's love life um, throughout it, which is really. Sad. I mean, it just kind of adds more to kind of. He's just so focused ever since you know, as a little kid, you know. Ever since yeah, then, that, it's kind of a that you know, murder. On your mind. That murder really messed him up. Um, <laughs> no time for women. <laughs> yeah. The murder, yeah. the strangling, the burning, yeah. the yeah. absent father figure that he kind of replaces a little bit with Achilles, but he, you can tell he's also kind of yearning for it with Hatham and everything. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. And then eventually killing Hatham, killing his childhood friend. Like it's just like, oh yeah, that's. <laughs> oh God, <laughs> that was so terrible. I was just like, oh. Pilot the least of my worries. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's sad. Um, yeah, it's a, I don't know. I mean, I it, to give Connor an, a, a relationship would would have to give him a whole new dynamic, uh, a whole new side of himself. And I, I mean, the game is really long already. I mean, that would I guess that would, yeah. <laughs> that'd, that'd be like a whole other side story, you know, his relationships and stuff. I think um, because. Connor is the type of guy I think that would, like you said, would want to have a family and want to, you know, respect that and do it right, and and not be such of a ladies' man running around to different, different uh, chicks all over the map there, you know. So I, I think that's kind of why they ge- they kind of geared it towards that, you know. Yeah. Ezio was, I think, I think Ezio had some girlfriends though, pretty sure. Oh yeah, yeah. yeah even <laughs> yeah, even with um yeah. like. I think with like Clay and stuff, I, 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 just, I feel like there's been some kind of debate around kind of Clay's lineage, Subject 16 and stuff. But I think one of the ones was, I don't know if this is the canonical one now, is like Ezio basically had a, just like a one night stand or something. And like, that's where Clay's lineage, <laughs> like he couldn't, they couldn't follow Ezio through Clay anymore because like he just, Ezio just had this one night stand and then they're like, oh crap, we go get Justin <laughs> or something like, <laughs> right. I don't know if you guys uh, know what I'm Good talking job. about. Um, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that rings a bell, but yeah, <laughs> yeah. Ezio definitely. I mean, like the first one of the first things you do is Ezio after you get in a street fight. You know, you go have a cool moment with your brother, and then you go Hello, back Christina. on a girl, <laughs> right? <laughs> and then brotherhood, he's like okay. with Katarina, and then like it's just it's such a contrast, right? And then you have Connor. Yeah, he, it's just... he is. He is. And like I said, I mean, that was one of the things I was worried about because people were all become so attached to him, mm-hmm. you know, and then all of a sudden now he's gone. And who's this dude? Yeah. He's not. He's not. Where's he's not with the ladies. He's not smiling. He's not happy go lucky. I miss Ezio. You yeah. know, I was like, oh, crap. <laughs> it doesn't <laughs> Just help give it that. some time. Look at his story. <laughs> Watch him arc. See, see how he changes. It's gonna be fun. Yeah. You know, the gameplay is really great. Please try it. <laughs> yeah. yeah, it really doesn't. It, it doesn't help when when Ezio had such a great send off too. With especially with you know you have three games worth of character development. You follow him over his life, and then you have Embers, which is like. One of the, you know, he has this amazing speech in Embers that Darby wrote for him. And, like, it's just so touching. And then it's like, okay, <laughs> those are the shoes you got to fill, right? <laughs> it's kind of yeah. a little daunting. Right. Um, yeah. 
Yeah, it was. It was. And I, you know, I haven't really, I haven't really looked to see how people reacted to to Connor yet. I've only had positive um, feedback from you know friends, family, coworkers. So I try not to read reviews because. I just don't like hearing people talk crap about me, <laughs> and that's kind of you know, like that's kind of a critic's job. I mean, to yeah. talk to, to say things that they don't like or things you know review it badly or you know, it's it's, it's hard for for me to, to to read that stuff because first of all, I can't defend myself and defend my choices, and then you know I start thinking about it all day, and then then that that becomes you know affecting my performance and in, in future things. Mm-hmm. So I, I just all I have is like, like I hope people like it, you know, and it's not, you know, it's already done, so there's nothing I can do about it now. Yeah. I enjoy the game, and a lot of my friends do, so yeah. I'm happy with the performance for sure. Yeah, yeah I am it's too. Different. It's different though. It's not as immediately. It's I, I can't. I've been thinking about Connor's character ever since I finished the single player like a month ago, and I think it's really the vocal performance and the character are really. There's so many layers there that you have to really. It's not as immediately relatable like we talked about with Ezio. And so I just, I've just grown to appreciate it more and more as time goes on. Kind of like all the rage he has built up that he gets, he kind of lets out, like both in when he's yelling at people, but also like when he's fighting. This is something I talked about with Corey at um, E3, actually, where Corey said like the idea, there's kind of an idea where um, when he's fighting, you see all these expressions on his face where he's almost like screaming, like not, there's no audio for it, but like... He, like Connor's face is like really oh. angry in a lot of these moves. He's, and yeah, mouth goes open. Like I've seen it happen. He gets you angle the camera down when he doesn't, you know, really heavy hit, yeah. and he's just like ah. You can yeah. see it sounds almost like he's whoa. <laughs> and Corey and Corey have kind of been talking about that's kind of this idea, and that's like one of his outlets for, um, like kind of everything different from Ezio's outlets. Um, <laughs> quite, quite different, quite different. <laughs> but yeah and I've, you know, like, I'm only speaking for myself but like I've really come to love Connor as a character and the vocal performance just like as I think about it more and more and I've rewatched some scenes like um, you know on YouTube and stuff to kind of get it, it just takes more time to dig into it I think um, that's I just, think like I try to make it more subtle yeah is exactly. what it is it's just subtle changes and subtle things and yeah. You know, he comes out in the way he fights too. He's he's way more vicious and brutal than Ezio. Yeah, you know, the things he does to people is like, whoa, that is just mean. Yeah, you know, that's just that's dirty and mean. Um, and Ezio seems to be a little bit more of classy kind of a guy. <laughs> way he kills people it's very stylish and it's good yeah. i like to stab people in the face and afterwards we'll go get what do you say yeah, it's no funny. i'm not anywhere i'm gonna stab them in the face and go yeah pretty much it's funny you talk about um connor's personality being more subtle and everything there was a one of the highest voted community questions was from alfred l in canada who asks um is there anything about connor's personality that you feel is more subtle or not immediately obvious on the surface uh yeah, softer side. Like his softer side is, is very subtle. Like you say, mm-hmm. his smile it does it doesn't come, but when it does, it means more. You know, exactly. the guy's smiling out throughout the entire thing, and when he does smile, it doesn't. Well, he's been smiling the whole time, you know, whatever. <laughs> but when you see it's something like that, the guy's like this for a long while, and then all of a sudden he starts to you see it an arc, uh, something happen, then you know it resonates with you and. Mm-hmm. I think that was one of it. His his sense of humor and his and you know and and the softer, nicer side. Because a lot of his scenes are people taking advantage of him, lying to him, telling him to go here, telling him to go there, running errands for people, uh, you know, being talked down to, being you know people you know in jail. Like all, I mean, he just goes through a lot of negativity throughout his early years and throughout the game. So. When something good happens, it's, it means more, mm-hmm. and uh, it resonates more a little bit. So that's kind of that's kind of where the subtleties lie, I suppose. Yeah. Remember all the animals he pets. Yes, and that, <laughs> right. I love the, pet, the animal petting thing. It's actually true. Even yeah. when he's hunting, you know, when he goes to skin the animal, yeah, well, he like yeah, says well. a word for them. Yeah, that's thank you. Yeah, yeah, well, thank you. Mm-hmm. That's what you do when you kill. You know, when you kill an animal, you just do that. So. Because the animal gave its life for you to 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 live, to eat, to turn into a stove. You got it. <laughs> or something. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> craft it into something bizarre or something. <laughs> craft the as long as you use the you know the hidden blade. Otherwise, your pelt's going to be damaged. That's not yeah, bad. exactly. Watch out for that. <laughs> cool. 
right. So, so Gio, I didn't mean to skip over you. Um, if you had a favorite moment or line for Connor, come back um, to this. <laughs> well, I I really liked the line. <laughs> um, I I really liked the line at the hanging. The I I will not die today. But um, another one I liked was from the homestead when he has to corral the pigs for um <laughs> for the farmers. I thought that was really. Funny, where he's like pissed off. He's like, the things I do for this place. He's like so mad. <laughs> yeah. And then uh, as far as my favorite scene, um, as far as my favorite scene, I like, I really like the end of sequence six at the end of the Boston Tea Party where Connor is holding the last crate of tea and he's looking across the harbor at Charles Lee and Charles Lee's like snarling and he just drops the crate of tea like, oh, what you going to do about it? Like, yeah. I, I like that. So I remember thinking I remember thinking that when we were doing it, I was like, okay, there's a couple ways I could do this. I could take it, I could step up there and just throw it at him and be all angry, or I could just look at him in like the face like, I'm dropping this. I'm on here. <laughs> Why are you yeah. mad, though? <laughs> Why are you mad, though? <laughs> yeah. mad though? But, oh, no, I didn't. <laughs> all I got in this world is my word and my balls, and I don't break it for nobody. You you want to you wanna start something? Then you make a move. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, um... Yeah, I love all those moments personally. Um, I, I do really love the scene where he's finally meeting Charles Lee, and it's just like there's no words. Um, like Charles takes his swig, hands it over to Connor, and it's just like all this, all these emotions going through their face, kind of looking at each other, kind of both resignation on Charles' part and Connor finally just being like, "It's finally over. Like this is happening," kind of almost. I'm just slide him over and stab him, and you know, let's get it done with. <laughs> yeah, I, I really like that. Thing. Um, as far as lines go, and I, I wish I could remember the exact phrasing of it. I really like when um, when he's with Charles, uh, sorry, not Charles, Jesus Christ, George Washington and Haytham. And Haytham has just <laughs> revealed um, that Washington ordered the burning of his village. And then, like, Connor gets angry at Haytham as well because obviously he was sitting on this information for a while. And he basically just says, like, if either, I wish I could remember the exact phrasing, but if either of you tried to, like, follow me or interfere, I will kill you. Basically. Yeah, I remember that. I can't remember the. I can't remember the line. Um, yeah. That was a tough scene. Uh, <laughs> I mean, they both basically lied to me and 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 responsible for the the deaths. And now I'm like their errand boy, and it becomes this is it. This is the last time you follow me again. I will end you. <laughs> like, you know. <laughs> yeah, I, I really like that because it's kind of you know Connor's a little bit naive throughout the story. He's kind of. Um, in a way and th I feel like that moment is where he finally like kind of gives up on you know the assassin templar truce or whatever he was thinking of earlier kind of like you know it's just the penny drops for him and he realizes that you know it's not going to work out with him and his father he can't like the the goals he'd been working for he's kind of been betrayed by the patriots as well and just I think it's it up until that moment he's kind of he's kind of being used a lot by a lot of people yeah and it's like and it's like at that moment he finally says no. Like I am, I, I feel like it's kind of the start for me. I, I really it's it's turning, kind of, yeah, a it's turn a turning point. point, absolutely. And it's kind of getting into other topics or whatever. But I think more than any other character, any other assassin, I've wanted um, a sequel with Connor more than more than Ezio or Altair because I really feel like by the end of AC three, he's finally kind of dealing with the consequences of everything that's happened. Like he's helped the Patriots, but at the end. His village is, you know, taken over by, uh, you know, the, the patriots basically, and his people have moved. And it's like he's kind of just realizing he can't just follow what other people tell him. And he's, I feel like he's a lot wiser at the end, even as it's tragic. And I just really want to see another game with him where I feel like he's poised to finally find, um, you know, some happiness in his life. You know that he eventually finds, he at least has a one night stand. But I would assume he actually has like, you know, a nice family, right? <laughs> Connor doesn't seem like the one night stand type of guy because yeah. you know Desmond's his his descendant, and so at some point, you know, he finds some semblance of love. I would assume, and I've really let's, just... let's hope for that. I'm I'm on I'm on the same train with that buddy. Let's hope for it. <laughs> <laughs> the guy has a tragic life, man. Yeah, he deserves I, it. Exactly. I feel like he's yeah. due for some happiness in his life. I feel like he's in a good position to kind of, in a way, kind of do what Ezio did in Brotherhood, where he kind of comes as his own as a leader and kind of staking out, you know, but now he's like, you know, do things by his own principles now. And just like, I, I really, really want to see like a sequel with Connor. I, you know, I, I have not, I don't have any knowledge of any sequel for AC. I mean, they're, they, you know, they wouldn't even tell me that it was AC when I was auditioning the, the, the third <laughs> time. So 
telling me about any future AC projects is like, I mean, I've, I've, I believe me, I've asked because I'm a gamer. Like, you know, so what's up next? You know, or, <laughs> and then, what, what are we gonna do? Let's do some, let's do some something else. And they're like, ah, well, you can't tell you, you know, it's the way it is. And so, but I, I mean, I would love to reprise a role and do it again and and go through a new new story and to see to see Connor move uh, in, towards a you know a different different end. But um, I think. For me, uh, Revelations was kind of like, I felt a little like, what? This is basically the same game, you know, it, it, except for the story different. You know, he's, he's changed. He's older man now. We continue the story. But I, I've, heard, I've heard through chat or through other gamers that Revelations kind of wore the character out. Like AC2 was great. Brotherhood was great. And then in the third one, it was like they were coming out year after year after year. And so it was... It, it seemed like the same engine that was running the game, the same gameplay, and not not a lot was being improved on it. And it seemed like they were just trying to ca- ca- cash in on it a little bit more. And I don't think they want to make that similar th- thing happen with Connor. And I, I really don't want him to be overdone and then p- so people get sick of him. But, I mean, at the, at the same time, there are tons of people who love Ezio who would have loved to see another Ezio game happen. So. Yeah. I mean, it goes all different ways. Different people want different things. Um, yeah. But as far as Connor becoming, you know, doing another game, I, I don't know. It, it, <laughs> honestly, what I want, I mean, to tell you the truth, I wanted, when I was reading the script, I wanted him to die at the end. I thought that that would have made everything a lot more powerful and impactful. But you can't do that, you know, because people, you know, you just can't do that. But in my opinion, it was like, man, if he died, it would have been a, a martyr, like, you know, in yeah. and. It would have made his. It would have just made that whole struggle you just went through was like, dang. After all that, yeah. he just dies. That's heavy. That's harsh. Yeah. But that's how life is. You know, life isn't always rainbows and butterflies. It's, it's bad things happen to people sometimes. And that's very true. Realistic, but it, you know, it's not as entertainment wise. It's not, and it's not as lucrative. So <laughs> <laughs> that's very true. I, I think there's also. My heart. Oh, sorry. Go ahead, Andy. I said it would have broken my heart. Yeah. Well, no, right? It would have been. <laughs> would have yeah. really hit you. And it's like the yeah. unluckiest character ever. Like, <laughs> just like. But I think there's also narrative constraints to doing something like that, too, because they introduced this thing in, you know, the, the whole concept of the animus is once um, they conceive the child, which is the next uh, ancestor in the, in the line, the perspective shifts to the child, right? And so if you want to show the death of. A major character, you have to get really creative with it, which is, you know, for Altair, they did it through these keys that Ezio looked at, right? And for Ezio, they just said, fuck the whole animus premise in general, we're going to do a movie, right? Like, <laughs> <laughs> and so it's, I think there's, there's a little, it's tricky, I think, yeah, but that would have been, I don't know, I, I, I'm glad he didn't die at the end of this one because, like I said, I don't know if, I don't know if, I think a trilogy would be wearing it out, just like Ezio kind of got a little, um, worn out a little bit at the end but i think there's absolutely one more game for connor to really do some really cool stuff with his character and let him finally find the happiness that he deserves right you kind of get a taste of it in the homestead but i think he has a he has a lot more in his future going for him i'd love to do i mean that was my initial thought when i was first working on the game uh he should die at the end um but after going through it like you say I now, especially now, I had so much fun working on it that I would just love to do five more, <laughs> you know. <laughs> but I don't, you know. Of course, that's not gonna happen, you know. But I like the con- I like to do the acting. I lo- I love to act, and I love to work with the with Ubisoft. So, I mean, by all means, I'd love to do it for sure. Just keep just keep telling them that <laughs> we want more Connor. <laughs> Cool. All right, so we should probably start wrapping this up. Maybe I'll run through one or two more community questions that we didn't quite get to. Let me look through these real quick. Sure. Um, let's see. You want me to say, where, where is Charles Lee one more time? <laughs> that would be amazing. <laughs> yes. Where is Charles Lee? <laughs> <laughs> where is Charles Lee? <laughs> uh, yeah, that's the one I'm more used to. You like the, you like the, the softer one? Okay. Well, I can I can do a garage band thing if you... No, I was kidding. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. Um, Make it your ringtone. <laughs> yeah. Make it your ringtone. I'll totally want that. <laughs> Set it to like a beat in the background. Just, like... <laughs> just all the versions of him asking. Well, and well, it escalates well, the longer well, you well. don't pick up. <laughs> yeah, worse. Yeah, and he starts getting yeah. angrier and angrier. <laughs> angrier and angrier. <laughs> it's your phone. <laughs> yeah. Uh, actually, we hit we hit most of the um, 
the, yeah. like the good chunk of the question. So, um, so what's next for you, Noah? Um, you, uh, you know, you're not, you don't know what's going on with the Assassin's Creed games, but um, what's going on next? Well, uh, I'm gonna be. I'm just got a call from a director from a friend of mine, and he's gonna be doing a movie. Can't talk about what it is, but I'm. I basically want to get back and start doing some more television and film. Uh, I've also, as of last night, just completed a, a four song EP mix that I've been working on because um, I play, I play uh, lead guitar and sing in a in a rock a trio kind of bluesy um, psychedelic band. And uh, so I'm I'm gonna start playing shows here in LA probably January uh, maybe mid December. Oh wow! Uh, so I'm gonna start focusing a lot on my music um, and really try to get you know push out this uh, this four songs that I've just done and start recording uh, start recording some more um, maybe in March. Um, but I've been really I mean really focusing on music recently. Um, I've been having a lot of fun with it so. That's really where my mindset is right now, as far as this uh, holiday season comes. Cool. That might be a good time to plug uh, your websites at noahwatts.com and noahwatts.net, um, because I imagine you'll put up the tour dates and stuff when you're playing in LA. Yeah, I'll put up shows and and I'll probably make a um, like a Facebook music page yet, but it, I'm still in early de- development of the band, um, so. We'll see see how it folds out, you know. Bands are tricky. Yeah. It's like there's a lot of people involved and it's kinda like relationships and stuff, so you gotta you gotta make sure you have a right fit with all your key players. Um so I'm working all that out, but yeah, there will definitely be links for that on my website. And I will probably put up tracks for free to listen to of my earlier stuff. So awesome. yeah. Cool. So. Definitely look forward to that. So All right, cool. I think that'll just about wrap up this episode. So uh, I want to thank all our guests for joining us today, and especially Noah. So thank you so much for joining us. It's been my pleasure. You all have fun. (laughs) (laughs) Awesome. Yeah, it's been awesome. I hope you're welcome to the Brotherhood, you know. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yeah. Okay, so as I said earlier, you can keep up with Noah at noahwatts.com and noahwatts.net. Um, for the rest of us, you can find me on YouTube and Twitter and everything at Loomer979. Esco is G-B-I-E-S-C on YouTube and Esco Blades on Twitter. Um, Geo at everythingaskcreed.tumblr.com and ND at enduro.deviantart.com, uh, E-N-D-U-R-O. So until next time, bye for now. Thank you.